You know, as we dive in this morning, I uh, am starting a brand new series called Raise the Standard. I really believe that right now in our country that we're at a vital time, the direction that we move forward in. I think that as we look at our homes, our communities, and what's going on in our schools, and that there has just been an increase of unrighteousness, an increase of the enemy. Now, let me just stop and say, how many know in life we face things? And you know, sometimes when we face things, it's because life happens, right? How many know sometimes we face things because of a decision that we made and now we're experiencing the consequence of that decision? How many know that happens sometimes? But we also need to understand that sometimes there are things that are taking place because we're in a spiritual battle. In fact, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, it says this, it says, for we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. In other words, there is a spiritual force that is out there to steal, to kill, to destroy. And sometimes we have to step back and realize, okay, it's time for me to stand up and fight. But how many know you can't fight a spiritual battle in the flesh? You have to fight it in the spirit. And so as we look at this passage today in Isaiah 59, and we're going to read it all together, as I was praying about this, because we kind of sense that, we, we see that there's it's just a pivotal time. In fact, it's not just here at Higher Vision. You know, across the country, pastors and leaders are rallying people to prayer, to pray in spiritual warfare. We saw it at Azusa Now in the Colosseum. They had gatherings the National Day of Prayer, I was down last week, and we were there praying for 12 hours. There were different pastors coming, leaders, people praying, interceding for our country, our city, our schools, our families. We, we see it happening. There's an event coming in, in Washington, D.C., where they're gathering people to pray. So I think there's an awareness. The antennas are up. God is doing something, and I feel like that we need to take a few weeks and talk about this topic. So I want you to stand to your feet, and we're going to read this passage in Isaiah 59, verse 19. I want us to all read it together out loud. Those of you joining us online in Amsterdam and wherever you are, Latvia, we're just so glad. I want you to read this passage with us together today. God has looked at the condition of his people, and so the prophet now is giving a word for the people. And here's the, the word that he gives. Read it with me all together. Ready? When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. And that's a good promise. Somebody say amen. amen. So we're going to talk about raising the standard. And if you read this passage in Isaiah 59, verses 16 through 21... There are four ideas that jump out that I believe are patterns or things that God has given us to help us see victory and breakthrough. Anybody feel like there's some things you need to see, some change or a victory or a, a breakthrough? Say amen if that's you. So I want you to close your eyes. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just pause to make room for you. We ask you to speak through every word that's given on the stage. Anoint our hearts and our minds to receive the truth because knowing the truth will set us free. God, I'm asking you to raise up an army that we wouldn't sit back passively and say, well, I hope things get better at home. I hope my son turns around. I hope that everything goes okay with the elections. I hope, Lord, I pray that you would raise a standard. Say this with me. Say, raise the standard and speak to me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you're a guest today, normally I like to be funny. I like to tell jokes and use stories. But today, I have a very intense, passionate message I want to speak with you. So there's going to be a little passion coming today. But know that there's a reason for it. When we read this verse in Isaiah 59, there's a couple ways to look at it. And the thing I want to focus on, first of all, many theologians believe the punctuation is wrong. Because really the way it reads and the way it's translated can be this. And that is, when the enemy comes in, comma, like a flood, the Lord will raise a standard against him. 
The concept there is that God is like a raging flood that is able to arise. And how many know when a flood moves in in power, it, it has the ability to wash and wipe everything out? So when the enemy is coming, here's the good news. Like a flood, the Lord can rise up and wash away and remove and take care of the things the enemy is trying to accomplish. Amen? Isn't that a good message? The other concept that's here is a standard. God rises up like a flood and raises a standard. Now, when we think of standard, I thought that the, the meaning of that was kind of like a wall, right? But if God's the flood, we don't need a wall. So what is a standard? And as I began to look into it, the idea of a standard, you can see behind me, is the, the picture of a battlefield. There's a war that's taking place, and what the standard was, when I was in high school, we had um, our mascot, the, and it was the Selma Bears, that's who we were. And we would go to the games or whatever, it was, a, it was an athletic event, say you're at a basketball game, the mascot would grab a standard, he would grab a banner, and it said Selma Bears on it, and he'd run across you know, the, the field, or he'd run across the court, and as he did, everybody would, you know, do the wave. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to make you do the wave this morning, because I've done it before, but a standard was in battle that they would raise this banner, and as they raised the banner, it would rally the army around it. So the army would rally around the standard, they would receive their, their um, war plans of how to fight, the strategy and they would declare who the enemy to the enemy who they were fighting. So in this passage, God wants to arise as a flood to wipe out the enemy through a standard. And I believe God wants to raise the standard. And now if you look at the passage, the, the context was that the people of Israel had kind of turned away from God. They were heading to exile. A prophetic message came from God of hope. And the prophetic message of hope was is that God hasn't forgotten you, that he's going to arise, he's going to fight for you, he's going to raise the standard. Now, this is a messianic passage. Many scholars believe that Isaiah is referring to the coming of Christ who would bring the ultimate victory, the victory over sin. And if you look historically, we're sitting here today because this has been fulfilled. God brought that victory. He arrived. He raised the standard and defeated the enemy. He raised Jesus on a cross, and the enemy was defeated. But I believe this passage has revel, you know, revelatory um, truth for you and I that is helpful for us in this idea of fighting a victory against the enemy. So over the next several weeks, we're going to learn some strategies to find victory and to, to see God arise like a flood. We're going to raise a standard. The enemy is going to be defeated and we're going to see a breakthrough. Anybody want to say and claim that? Say amen. amen. So let's go to one of the verses that lead into our theme verse. As they describe the condition of Israel, then this is what God says in Isaiah 59, verse 16. He says, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no, what's the next word? There was no what? If you continue on reading, then it says, therefore his own arm brought salvation. So God sees the situation. The enemy is raging. He's defeating his people spiritually, culturally, in every way. And God begins to look for an intercessor. So I'm going to give you the big thought for this week. Every week is going to have a big thought, and then I'm going to give you some points. The big thought is simply this. If we're going to raise the standard, if God is going to do that, we have to raise the standard through intercession. We raise the standard through intercession. Now, let's kind of talk a little bit about this, because as we see, God, when he sees the condition, he starts to look for an intercessor. He looks for someone. In fact, this reminds me of the, the passage in Ezekiel 22, verse 30, which many people know. And is, I sought for a man among them who would stand in the gap and build a wall so that I wouldn't have to destroy the people. God was looking for someone to arise, to stand in the gap, to fight with him. We see this in a very well-known verse that's connected to intercession because prayer is intercession. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter or 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. It says, if my people will humble themselves and what? Pray. 
and pray. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will hear their land. As I began to think about this passage and what God might be saying to us today, th this is the thing that kept sounding in my heart, and it's simply this. In Isaiah, basically, God says, I'm going to fight for you. God is waiting to fight for you. How many say, that's a good news? But here's the other part. He's waiting for a fighting partner. God wants to fight on your behalf, but he's waiting for someone. He's looking for someone who will join him in the fight. Because when you raise the standard, the army is to rally. God is raising the standard because he's wanting you and I to rally to him to join the fight. Now, I don't think Isaiah 59, 19 is saying if we don't fight, God will not fight for us. Or if we don't fight, God will do it all. But what I do believe it's saying is this, is that there is a level of breakthrough and freedom and victory that comes when you and I engage in battle with him. God is not dependent on your participation, but there is a power that comes when you join forces in his efforts. And how do we join forces? Well, one of the ways we see is through intercession. Now, let's talk about intercession. What does the word intercession mean? In this particular part of the Bible, in Isaiah 59, 19, the word intercessor is a Hebrew word which means to intervene. Everybody say to intervene. So God is looking for someone to intervene. Now, there are three ideas in the definition. One is he's looking for people who entreat or pray. So prayer is a form of intercession. The second idea is to have an effect by violence or action. So we're a part. Intervening is you're engaging in the process. You're having an impact. And number three, the other idea that comes out is that we can come between to prevent or to alter. Have you ever seen two people that are about to fight and then someone kind of jumps in the middle and says, hey, hey, hold on, guys. Listen, let's bring this down. Let's not resort to violence. Come on, you guys, let's just talk this through. And so they're able to intervene to affect the outcome. Isn't it interesting that it says that God is looking for an intercessor? Because here's what intercession, intercession is intervention. Have you ever heard, they just need an intervention? Can I tell you, America needs an intervention. Your family needs an intervention. And so God is looking for people who will become intercessors. Now, we pray, and many times when we pray, we're talking to God. But let me define then intercession in relation to prayer, because prayer, intercession, or intercessory prayer is going to God on behalf of somebody else. So God's people, God is looking for them to intervene, to rise up. I think for too long, we have a tendency. I have felt an increase. We've seen it with people in our church. It just seems like there's an increase of, of things happening in our culture, in our city, in our schools. And, and so we can do this. We can sit back and we can pray prayers and say, well, I hope things change. Or we can sit back and say, well, I hope things get better. Maybe one day, God, I hope you do something. God's saying, no, 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 I will fight. But will you fight with me? Will you, will you intercede with me? Will you intervene with me? Will you rise up and join the battle? We're going to raise the standard. So I'm going to give you some practical ways that you and I can be intercessors, can intervene in prayer. This week we were sitting at the table, and uh, as we were talking at the table and going around, we always do highs and lows around the table, so everybody tells their high for the day and their low for the day, and, and we, we do that every, every time we eat together. And as we were going around, my wife said, man, my lows, I've got a headache. My headache is just pounding. And so Mr. Man of Faith and Mr. Pastor immediately thought, well, we need to get you some Advil. <laughs> now, Advil is great, and there's nothing wrong with Advil. We should, you know, think of medical things that God has given us to bring healing. But my son said, well, wait a minute. Why don't we just pray for mom? Let's pray for mom right now. And he goes, Dad, you know, all week long I've been thinking, you know, how often is it that we just, you know, we don't realize that we can pray? He said, in fact, the other day I prayed for someone that had a headache because they said they had a headache. And I said, well, let me pray for you. And the headache went away just like that. So he said, come on, let's all pray. And he put his hand on mom, and we all put our hand on mom. And I'm like, go, son, go. <laughs> I'm like, yes. And we began to pray. Because let me tell you, prayer, and I've said this before, but prayer should be our first response and not our last resort. Guys, can you bring that up? Prayer should be our first response 
and not our last resort. I think that might be what God is trying to say as he looked at the nation of Israel and he's, as he's looking at America, as he's looking at your home. So we're going to learn how to intervene, how to step in, be a part of the solution with God in the fight. We're going to talk about inter- Session. We're going to talk about intervening in prayer. I'm going to go fast today, and I want to encourage you to take notes because you want to get this information. You ready? Here's the first thing. If we're going to intervene or be an interceder, here's the first thing. Intercessor, we intervene with reminder prayers. Intervene. If you want to be an intercessor, you intervene with reminder prayers. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's talk about one of the great intercessors in the Bible, someone who intervened through prayer and action. His name was Nehemiah. And he knew that Israel had, some of the exiles were coming back, that God, you know, were coming back, but they were in the city of Jerusalem again, but they were being defeated by the enemy. And they needed walls around the city. And when he finds out that they're not really walking in victory, they're not really experiencing what God had promised them, here's the prayer he prayed. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4. We're going to look at some different prayers and some different examples in scripture. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 says, and when I heard this, Nehemiah says, for days I mourned fasted, and what? And prayed. And then look what he says. Then I said, O Lord. Now here's the prayer of intercession that he prays. O Lord of heaven, listen to my prayer. Please what? Please what? Remember what you told your servant Moses. If you return to me and obey my commands, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name. You know, I love about this passage is as he goes to God in intervention or in prayer, he goes to God in prayer by saying, God, I want you to remember a promise you made to us. When we go in prayer, maybe you're thinking about your children. Maybe you're, you, you have a, a parent that's sick and, and has cancer like I do. You know what? Sometimes we tend to go, well, God, I hope that you can heal them. God, I, I hope that, that you just touch them. I hope that the chemo works. And we throw up a little prayer here and there. We throw the Hail Mary up and say, God, I hope you do it. You know what? Could it be that God is waiting for us to stand up as an intercessor and say, God, listen, my dad is sick. And so I remember a promise you made that says, if we're sick to call the elders of the church and that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. So God, remember the promise that you can raise him up. In fact, God, remember the promise you made that by his stripes we were healed. So Lord, I pray for my father that he'll be healed from his cancer because you said by his stripes we're healed. Remember the prayer. Remember the promise that you made to us. You want to rise up and join the fight intervene with remembering prayers. Remind God of his promises. You ready for another one? Let's go on. We also intervene with favor prayers. Favor prayers. Favor, look at that, third time's a charm. Intervene with favor prayers. What do you mean by that? I know the Grammar is kind of weird, but it works for my point, so just hang in there, all right? <laughs> Nehemiah doesn't finish the prayer with, God, remember what you said. He goes on, and here's what he says in Nehemiah 1.11. He says, oh, Lord, please hear my prayer. Please grant me success today by making the king, what? Favorable, Favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. I want to tell you that I think God is looking for people who rise up in prayer. And they don't just remind God of his promises, but they pray for his favor. God, give me favor. I, I want to tell you that I remember the days back, like Nehemiah. Nehemiah was getting ready to go before the king. And he knew the only way that, that Israel could be rebuilt, that the walls could be rebuilt, is that the king would give him the resources and the authority to build it. So as he was going into this meeting, he said, God, I pray. I'm intervening. I'm interceding. So, Lord, give me favor favor. You know, when we were starting Higher Vision Church, I knew that God had a promise, and the promise was that he wanted to plant a church called Higher Vision in the Santa Clarita Valley, that many people were going to be saved, that thousands were going to come to Christ, that we're going to raise up and send people out. I knew that was his plan, and so as I was raising the resources, I would go and meet with business leaders and denominations and churches, and every time before I would walk in, I would say, God, remember the promise you made. You're going to build a church called Higher Vision, so Lord, give me favor today when I meet with that business guy. Give me favor today when I 
meet with that, that religious leader. Lord, I pray that their heart would be stirred, that they would open up their pocketbooks and they would support the vision, that they would pray for us, that they would believe in us. I'm going to tell you, God is looking for people to call on his favor. Remember Jabez? Jabez is in the Bible. There's one verse in the Bible. And I believe he's in the Bible because he prayed for favor. It said that Jabez prayed, expand my territories. Bless me indeed. And it says, and God answered his prayer, and he was more honorable than the rest. God's waiting for a fighting partner, for someone. When was the last time when you were struggling with a situation with your kids? Or when was the last time that you were looking at a situation at your job and you're trying to figure out what to do, that you went to God and you said, God, I pray you give me favor with the principal. God, give me favor with, with this, this owner. God, I pray give me favor. Lord, give us favor in our... Lord, God, step in and show your power in this situation. Intercession, we intervene through... Prayers that we remember, we remind God through favor prayers. I'm going to give you another one. You ready? Intervene with protective prayers. Intervene with protective prayers. Why don't you write that down? We know that another example of a great intercessor or someone who intervened in prayer was Moses. The children of Israel had come to the, 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 the threshold of the promised land. But then they were filled with fear and doubt, and they quit believing. And so they began cursing God and cursing Moses, and God is so angry now. After he's done all that he's done to deliver his people, he's about to take them into the promised land, and they don't have the faith to trust him to do it. And so he tells Moses, I'm going to wipe them out, and I'll raise up another people. And Moses decided to step in. And have influence on the outcome. Look at what it says in Exodus chapter 32. He prayed a protective prayer. Isaiah, or I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 32 verse 11 says, But Moses prayed to pacify the Lord. Oh Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your own people? Turn away from your fierce anger. Lord, Lord, I'm asking for protection from them. Rather than wrath, give them mercy. Change your mind about this terrible disaster. Remember your saying. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven. He's talking about Abraham's descendants. And I will give them all of this land that I have promised. So the Lord changed his mind. Now, there's, that's a big theological concept to try to unpack, and I'm not going to do it. And, and can we change the mind of the Lord? I'm not here to, to say that. But what I am here to say is that you and I, when we pray, we have influence. And I believe God wants us to rise up and use the influence that we have in the relationship with God to make an Im impact, to have an effect on the culture, on the community, on the marriage, on the school, on the nation, on the places where God has placed us. But too often we sit back and we're passive rather than jumping up and say, God, I'm asking you for protection. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to parents, one parent in particular, their child got in an accident right out here in front of the church, and in talking to them, they said, Pastor, if it would have just been two inches different, I don't think my, my daughter would be here. You see, how many times do we pray, and this parent prays over their kids, Lord, I pray that you would, as the scripture says, that you would cause your angels to encamp around them, and you would watch over them when I'm not there. God, I plead the blood of Jesus over them, that nothing the enemy would do would be successful. Lord, your word said that no weapon formed against us will prosper. I want to encourage you, be a parent, be a person who will arise and intercede and say, God, I pray for protection over Higher Vision Church, and the leaders, and the people, and the volunteers. I pray for protection over your children. Lord, I pray that you'd watch over my kids when they're not under my supervision. Lord, watch over our city. God, watch over our nation. Watch over our schools. Well, I think intercessors are people who pray protective prayers. Yeah. Amen? Let's keep going. We also intervene with authority prayers. We intervene with authority prayers. There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 4 says... For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. You know what that, that tells us? It's that God has given us spiritual weapons 
And too many times we're fighting in the natural. There's a spiritual battle that's happening, and we're trying to just fight it in the natural. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing things in the natural as part of that process because we're body, soul, and spirit. So we want to be involved in the natural, but we also need to get involved in the supernatural. And those weapons that we've been given when we pray, it says that they have power. I think too often that we come to God and we come with this weak, anemic mentality rather than coming in faith, saying, I've been given. What did Jesus say? The authority I've been given, I give to you. In my name, you will cast out demons. In my name, you will lay hands on the sick. You see, we've been given authority, and it's called the name of Jesus. When Jesus would show up in a city, the demons would shriek because of the authority of his name. And I want to tell you, when you pray and you intervene on the behalf of whatever situation that you're going to God with, step up in an authority that says, I am a son and daughter of God, and I come not in my name. I don't come in the name of a denomination or a church or a religion. I come in the name of Jesus, which is above every other name. And I declare freedom. I declare hope. I declare breakthrough. Intervene with authority. Remember the sons of Sceva? They tried to cast out a demon. They said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the, and the demon jumps up and beats him up. Inside of this guy. Beats him up. And it says, Paul I know. And Jesus I know. But who are you? That's why it's important to understand that you can't just know the name. You need to know the man. And if we'll know the man, we can rise up with authority in that name to intervene and intercede. Amen? Amen. Let's grab another one. You ready? We intervene with persistent prayers. We inter intervene with persistent prayers. I'm trying to unpack some practical things this weekend. As you go into this time of prayer, as you begin to intercede, that you know what are things to pray? How should I pray? I had a woman come up to me after service last weekend on Mother's Day. She said, Pastor Jared, I love so much the service, and, and, uh, but I want to ask you a question. Is it okay to keep on praying over and over and over again for something when it hasn't been answered? And when she said that, I immediately went in my heart and I started talking to her about Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Luke chapter 18, verse 1, here's what Jesus said. One day... Jesus told his disciples a story to show them that they should, what? Always pray. What does that say? Always. Always pray and never give up. In other words, be persistent in our prayers. And then he said there was this woman who didn't get justice. And so she went back to the judge and she said, give me justice. He didn't give her justice. He went back again. She went back again. She went back again. And because she continued to persist, the judge ended up answering her request, not because he wanted to, because he was a good guy and he was righteous, but because he, he was tired of her bothering her. <laughs> Anybody ever had your kids do that? Give me a snack. Give me a snack. Give me a snack. Can I have a snack? Yes, you can have a snack. And then Jesus says, if an unjust judge will respond to persistence, how much more will a loving heavenly father intervene with persistent prayers? Maybe you're here and you've been praying for that parent to get saved and it's been 15 years and it hasn't happened and you're now just saying, well, I guess, God, if you want to do it, you'll do it. Maybe what you need to do is God is looking throughout the earth for someone to arise and say, I'm going to keep believing. God, I'm going to keep believing that it's your will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, Lord, I'm calling them home. I'm saying open their spiritual eyes to see they need Jesus. Intervene with prayers of authority. Reminding God, right, but with persistent prayers. Amen? Amen. I want to give you another one. we got two more. Come on. You ready? How many with me? Say amen. Yes. Intervene with number, the next one is intervene with fervent prayers. Now, if you've seen me today, you've seen I've gotten a little fervent, a little passionate up here. Reminded me of the story as I began to think about intercession of the church. The early church, Jesus had died, he had risen again. The apostles were leading the church. It was growing like crazy. So Herod takes Peter, one of the leaders, and throws him in prison and is going to kill him to try to stop out and stomp out what God was doing, this church, the way. And as he was in prison, here's what the church began to do. The Bible says in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, 
But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very what? Earnestly or fervently for him. Suddenly, now I'm going to kind of condense this whole story. Suddenly, there was a a bright light in the cell. And an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. Then the angel told him, put on your coat and follow me. So Peter left the cell following the angel. Now, if you read the story, he's literally in the innermost part of the prison, as far in the prison as you can be. He's chained up, and he's chained to two guards, one on each side of him. God causes all the guards to fall asleep into a trance, A light comes on, the door opens, his chains come off. He walks out of a prison filled with guards, filled with prisoners, and he's delivered, and the breakthrough came. But if you'll notice, the way the breakthrough came is that the church began to intercede fervently. And I want to encourage you with this idea that God listens to fervent prayers. In fact, James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us, it says, the earnest prayer... The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now, why am I sharing this point? Because I think too many times, rather than standing up to fight, we sit back and say, well, God, I hope, maybe, if something's going on in your marriage and you need to intercede for a marriage, if you need to intercede for a child, I believe we need to intercede for our nation. When was the last time you didn't just throw a Hail Mary on the way from the car into work where you threw up a quick prayer and said, oh God, or when you sat down to eat, you did a quick head bob and said, oh God, when was the last time you actually closed the blinds and got in your room and closed the door and you you turned off the lights and you turned up the music and you started walking back and forth across the carpet and you started saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you have a plan for my son or for my daughter. I thank you, God, that you birthed this nation with Christian principles and you've used us. So, Lord, I'm asking you to move once again in our country. Send revival, Lord, in our students. Send revival on the campuses. God, awaken the church. God, when was the last time you got fervent to God in prayer? We intervene with fervent prayers. And the last thing I want to share with you is this. We intervene with united prayers. What do you mean by that? What does that mean, Jared? If you look at Isaiah 59, 19, it says that when the enemy came in, like a flood, The Lord raised a standard against him. We know that the larger message of that was that God stepped in on our behalf and fought for us because we were sinners. But God didn't just let us go down our path of sin. He he fought for us and he raised the standard, Christ on the cross The Bible said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He raised the standard. Jesus died. He rose again. And now what is the standard? What is the standard that God raised to win the victory? You can find it in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 34. And here's what it says. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also... He's what? Interceding for us. Hebrews tells us he ever liveth to make intercession. Do you realize that one of the purposes of Christ's life is to be an intercessor? To go to God in intervention for us, for our kids, for our families. But here's the power. You and I, God is looking for someone to join the fight. Where two or three agree on earth. It will be done in heaven. I think God is looking for some people on earth to agree, but to agree in the supernatural to say, Jesus, I'm coming into agreement with you that the plan of God will be done in my life, that the plan of God will be done in our family, that the plan of God will be done in our city, in our schools, in our nation, that the plan of God will be done at this company. God, I'm coming into unity, into agreement with you that your kingdom will come on earth as you planned it in the heavens. Listen, here's a cool thing. Hear me. Every time you pray, 
You're not praying alone. You are uniting with the standard, Jesus. The flood of prayer, of breakthrough, of intercession that comes as Jesus has ever lived to intercede for us. You know, today we're going to bring this service to an end, but I want to say this. I believe God is stirring my heart, he's stirring our staff, and I believe he's calling our church to awaken to intercession. There's a lot of us who have been people of prayer at times. We do it at the first of the year for 21 days, and then we quit the thing God called us to do. We put down our sword, and we go back to camp. And I believe God is calling us over the next four weeks. I believe God is calling us to be people of intercession. I believe this is a vital time for our country. I believe it's a vital time for our culture. I believe it's a vital time. I know many families, my family, others, that it just seems like the, the increase of spiritual warfare. So the question is, is God going to fight alone or are you going to join the battle?